The Stoa is a digital campfire where we cohere in dialogue about what matters most at the knife's edge of what's happening now. Um, all right, everyone, welcome to the Stoa. I'm Peter Lindbergh, the steward of the Stoa, and the Stoa is a place for us to cohere and dialogue about what matters most at the knife's edge of this very moment. And today we're very lucky because we have Peter Jones uh, visiting the STOA. Um, Peter Jones is an associate professor of systemic design at OCAD University, uh, which is in Toronto, uh, where he teaches the strategic foresight and innovation and design for health programs. Um, and he leads innovative research and in flourishing econo economies, uh, cultural sustainability, healthcare system design, and complex social system design throughout OCAD and um, through his innovative research firm, the Redesign Network. Uh, and the title of today's talk is Living Through the Global Problematique, um, which I'm sure Peter will introduce uh, in a moment. And uh, he'll discuss the evolution of the global problematique, uh, which is a framework for complex societal problems. Um, so how today's going to work, uh, Peter's going to present for about 35 minutes. Uh, and then anytime when Peter's talking, you can throw your questions in the chat. I will call on you, unmute yourself, ask your question to Peter. If you want to read it on your behalf, because this will go on YouTube, uh, just let me know and I'll read it on your behalf. That being said, I will allow Peter to unmute himself and take him in. Welcome to the STOA. Excellent. Thank you, Peter. Um, and uh, uh, we are blessed and cursed to live in truly unusual times. Um, I'm uh, delighted to join the STOA for, for a talk. I participated in several other talks on the other side, and uh, I, I love how the community is going. And so as being somebody who's kind of local in this virtual space as well, um, living in Toronto and Greektown and teaching at OCAD downtown when we did have a downtown to teach in, um, I, I thought that I would uh, bring, at least for a first talk, to the STOA, um, uh, some of the ideas that um, underpin the, the development of, of my view of systemic design, uh, the, the discipline that I've been developing and teaching uh, at OCAD, the Strategic Foresight Innovation Program. And that goes back to my, my uh, years as a PhD student and working with uh, Dr. Um, Aleko Alexander Christakis who is around at the formation of the Club of Rome. And so kind of, I wasn't a young pup, but as a middle-aged pup or whatever, working with Aleko, I heard a lot of the stories of the Club of Rome, how it was formed, how it didn't really achieve uh, all the goals that, that uh, his school of systems thinkers thought that it might have. And, and I've, uh, I've done my own interrogation in this, you know, into that history, and and, and and it makes an interesting story because of the situations that we're facing today. And this is also the 50th anniversary year of the Club of Rome's um, uh, momentous uh, meeting, which is actually in New York. Uh, they defined their major agenda for um, uh, for the their uh, major study based on a prospectus developed by Hassan Ozbekan, uh, known as the, the predicament of mankind. And, and the predicament of mankind was uh, the brief, if you will, the design brief presented to the Club of Rome as the, the framework from which um, uh, several different proposals might be, might be presented. And Hassan Ozbekan's proposal was built into the brief itself. So he's probably, as he was chosen to, um, uh, present uh, the, the formulation of this prospectus. Um, he, you know, he also used as the opportunity to, to kind of sell his own approach. And I think that, uh, you know, that um, he wasn't selected uh, for the Club of Rome's uh, study, as we know the limits to growth was. But, but in that prospectus, he developed an approach to social systems design, which is, which is really has been with us since and has actually helped spawn a, a different school of systems thinking that has existed in parallel since that time. And, and it has quite a bit of, of 
quite a bit of life left into it uh, today, I think. So I want to uh, I want to say a little bit about the term, the problematique. Um, you may have heard that in other references before, and it, it, it is associated with both a systems model and a method of representation. So the problematique is kind of a thing that represents uh, the relationships of complex societal systems to each other, a mapping of them, and then it's also, in a generic term, how we represent that type of complex mapping. And it was a and Hassan Ozbekan was a fairly understated and it was well known in his own community, but kind of a think tanker of the 1960s. He was the, um, uh, he was the inventor of a field that back then was called normative planning that led into social systems design. And, and his, his mapping out of the problematique was a way to create a frame for sense making that is still, I think, very robust today, uh, uh, a framework that at that time, and I think still absorbs all the crises and conditions of modernity's transition from, uh, from 1970 was uh, a, a really clearly a transition period for a lot of the critical conditions that were mapped out in, in uh, the global problematique as, as it was called. And today we can see ourselves collectively entangled in, in the, uh, in the similar world system. If you look at how the problematique was formed, if you actually look up his paper, which you can do as a Google search on the predicament of mankind without even spelling Ozbekan, you'll find just a few references to it, which are probably my friends that hold copies of this paper. And so any meaning of, you know, of, of this phrase, of this, uh, this kind of entanglement of the problematique presents us with a, a view of the mega crisis, a cluster of interrelated crisis effects. And these are not core issues. That is, they're not driving root cause issues. They are very far from it. They are, they are the results of many years of, of, of effects being, uh, effects interconnecting to other effects. And it's a, and, and we can conceive of this with other, you know, with new terms. Uh, today, we, through geoscience, consider this kind of period of the mega crisis as, as entering the Anthropocene. Uh, and, and I see actually the mega crisis as, as, as a, a way of viewing uh, the problematique as a much larger set of wicked problems or a coffee and messes or riddles wicked problems or the idea of the, the super wicked problem of climate change as, it's, as it has been recently referenced. Uh, but I would say that the global problematique is uh, perhaps understated in its representation of these kind of terrifying crises conditions that we consider today because in 1970, even then it included um, climate and environment as separate single problem clusters. They were uh, among the 49 continuous critical problems and, the each one, and they were in and of themselves, you know, issues that were interconnected with those other issues. And so depending on how we view criticality, that is uh, what issues are critical to address and how and how we design to them, uh, there are several different modes to define, uh, several ways to define criticality as temporal leverage, that is uh, urgency of now or the urgency of taking action in the near term in order to make progressive action over longer term impacts. Um, uh, Ozbekan was, was very concerned with that, that in 1970 he believed we needed to take action now on some of these, not all of them, didn't believe you could address all 49 of the, uh, of the plot problem clusters kind of as a whole, but to think about them as a whole of connections and to find critical leverages. And, and actually this was before they applied the system dynamics models of uh, Forrester's MIT group and the limits to growth. So they didn't even call it leverage then. That wasn't a term used so much, or I think even in the problematique um, or in the, the predicament document, they talked about feedback imbalances, pretty much the same thing. And, that it, and so the goal of uh, the, pro the global problematique was to identify places where there would be significant critical imbalances in economy and food production, in, in war and conflict, in, in governance and policy, in population, in, you know, in uh, 
in, in many aspects of resource use and food production and all these drivers would impinge on other outcomes that um, could be even less survivable so that the outcomes could, the effects of these uh, problem systems, if you will, would be, um, would themselves be very, uh, would become uh, critical issues. And so there was a, an intent at, in the early stages of this, you know, trying to identify the issues in the problematique of what is critical, what to address uh, early and first so that we could make progress across the entire mapping of, of, of those issues to each other. And I usually present this with, you know, plenty of pictures and I show the, you know, show the uh, Osbekan's um, kind of, you know, um, crude view graph pictures from the 1970s and some updates of mappings of the 49 continuous critical problems. And because kind of the tradition in the Stoa is to just spell it out in words, I want to give you more of a, of the impression of, 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 of how, you know, well, some details about the problematique, but more of an impression of why it's critical rather than attending to the specific um, continuous critical problems themselves. But, but I also want to tie this to some other issues that I think are continuing within, um, that we hear a lot uh, within other talks in the STOA. So, I mean, we, um, we're interested in, in criticality and in a resolution, but not problem solving, which is going to be a distinction I'll bring up again. Uh, this is not a matter of problem solving, that problematique, even though it's named that way. So what we're trying to do is to, uh, over all these years, and this is now at the 50th anniversary of this kind of mode, we're interested in, um, in dealing with and, and offsetting the possible collapse scenarios that attend this mega crisis. The collapse scenarios in ecology and economy, politics and society, culture, of course, civilization. The dynamics of collapse have been developed well by other scholars, the system scientist Joseph Tainter and, and Timothy Allen, uh, the ecologists and botanists by economists uh, George S. Rosian in the, in the 1980s. And, and, and recently, the um, economics uh, blogger, uh, Charles Hugh Smith, who I really recommend, our, you know, who's, who's writing about this quite often. Um, and, and if you don't find Smith, I mean, he, he boils this down into bite-sized pieces and with graphs, and so really brings it to life. And, and also uh, authors you may have heard of, you know, of course, Thomas Homer Dixon, The Upside of Down, Jared Diamond's Collapse, Dmitry Orlov's kind of cycles of, of collapse. And these are all scholars that have really worked with the ideas that came out of the global problematique, but have addressed them in terms of their effects um, at this point. But, and so there were a number of social theories and historical cyclic theories, um, Strauss Howe's fourth turning, David Corton's great turning, Peter Turchin's um, um, structural demographics uh, um, cycles and models. And these are all useful informants and models, some of which might even help us act. So I mean, that's as a design professor and training des uh, designers, designers at the master's level, this is really where we're trying to connect this. So the history, I think, is is important to to address, but and, and, and is kind of interesting to bring forward. But you know, what can we? What should we really do to act? And it's an ethical issue. Um, so the best of these collapse scenarios really reveal transdisciplinary dynamics, uh, relationships that enable us to perceive the multiple dimensions of the problematique as a whole. So we can work at, so we have to work with different stakeholders, sometimes called experts as well, that may be experts in different disciplines, but then working across those disciplines to have an understanding across multiple perspectives in order to make sense of this type of a complex set of dynamics. And so this essential frame of the global problematique you can think of as the overlapping manifold complicated Pro and complex problems for which we register consensus and, pol and the political concern based on, the, on some consensus that we have, um, that we have agreement on what, what these, you know, what today's problems might be. 
And so we can see variations of strategic foresight at work in, that is in the orientations um, to the global problematique. In the last decade of social problem agendas, we've seen the United Nations Development Program, um, um, the Agenda 2030 and the development of, a, of, of the Sustainable Development Goals following the millennial, Millennium Development Goals. And the MDG, MDGs were considered, I guess, kind of an on-ramp. They probably weren't really a successful program, but as these things go, they got rolled forward into a, a significant emphasis in the SDG program, which let's see, from the badge here, I'm, I'm somewhat um, involved with, with a number of different groups that I'm engaged in. It has become um, I, perhaps the, the, you know, the most well-known framework for the representation of, of, um, of dealing with uh, the global problematique in today. We hardly ever hear the term problematique, but we, you will hear and you are hearing about the Sustainable Development Goals is perhaps the most notable and successful problem system or framing of a problem system today. But we're in 2020. Um, this is the year that was the year of the future when we started the Strategic Foresight and Innovation Program in 2009. Uh, 2008, our first students in 2009 and all of our first work in the strategic innovation lab in scenarios for future uh, future scenario constructs and for contract work and and shirk projects and, and such for, for for a lot of our lab work 2020 was always kind of the the clever decade ahead and then it was five years ahead and it's like we didn't actually budge the pointer to the future as we got closer to it I have seen, just speaking from my own experience as someone who works in strategic foresight as, um, uh, or, or adapts strategic foresight methods into um, uh, uh, everything from municipal planning and community energy planning, complex sustainability, strategic planning, you know, we push for longer term timeframes and almost in all cases, if we're working with um, uh, third horizon models, that is first, second, and third horizon, different time frames of, of um, uh, time horizons that are overlapping into um, uh, um, longer horizon futures in which these problems would be resolved. The, if we take a third horizon of, of 50 years into a planning context, can guarantee that we'll be asked to break it down into a 10-year plan at best at longest. And so, so this is where I, I feel that now we're in 2020 and we're facing kind of the results of, of several different <laughs> crises that have, that have impinged just within this year and in different failures that we can see that it, it's safe to say that, um, that many of the scenarios we were planning for for 2020 didn't actually happen. As we, as we proposed in the different, in the way that we can envision uncertainties over a 10 year period, we aren't aiming for prediction, but for scenarios which will give us insight and give our clients insight for being able to address options as they may occur, as those scenarios may appear, scenarios may appear. And then with respect to the, the, um, the work of the Club of Rome on the global problematique, they didn't actually conduct this type of um, scenario planning. Uh, instead, they ran system dynamics models on, on um, uh, you know, on uh, on variables that were simulated to to present um, various sim simulation outcomes for the relationship of the uh, of a subset of those issues in the forty nine continuous critical problems. So I'd ask, uh, do we face the decade of now coming up to 2030 with hope and engagement or with trepidation and dread or some odd mix of both, which is probably more the case. And we might in our communities of inquiry consider developing a view of the planetary mega crisis in a way that, 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 as it, that is another type of meta crisis with its that we have spoken about in the STOA, a meta crisis being a view above and over and containing some understanding and having a distance view from the collapses of meaning 
of telos, of direction, of ontology, of, of, of relationship in civitas, of the systemic fragility. These, I would say, are, are outcomes of these issues that were identified you know, many years ago, but they're, um, but they're not the causes. And so in the, the causes themselves are so far distant from, from the situation we're in today. So let me go back to kind of how the mega crisis was formed and named uh, as a global problematique by Hassan Ozbekan, who's a kind of a brilliant, I say, understated scholar that not a lot of people even know of. He, had, he didn't have that many publications. And most of the writings that really made a huge difference, I think, um, uh, that, I, that you can find of his are from the 1960s and before the Club of Rome. So as the scholar of a general theory of normative planning, that is that he developed in the, in the late 1960s, a view of, of um, long horizon futures oriented planning that would take into account um, strategy, operations, and the normative view. And so in, this, in the late 60s, you know, Hassan had drafted the concepts, the early concepts of a global problematique with 27 um, critical continuous problems. And, and those in, within two years were expanded, of course, just to be, whether or not to be dramatic, but he added, um, he added uh, over 20 more to construct a final set, which is presented at the Club of Rome in 1969-1970 as the 49. And just to read a few of these in their terms, I mean, they included um, uh, pop, uh, population growth, uh, urban sprawl, widespread poverty, insufficient education, the increasing lethality of weapons, um, uh, the generalized, and this is some of his wording, anachronistic and irrelevant education, generalized alienation of youth, um, ideological fragmentation, semantic barriers to communication between individuals, groups, and nations, inadequate participation of people at large in public decisions. And a lot of these sound like, if they could be addressed, would have significant impact on the resolution of the other kind of major effects in that, in that set. But he also included um, a, a, a small number of very provocative issues. Um, ide well, the ideological fragmentation, I think, is notable, but um, obsolete institutional arrangements, of course, the failure of imagination, and the failure to understand the nature of continuous critical problems. So he proposed this set as an illustrative, illustrative list. That is, it was just meant to be a, a list of, of problem clusters, but not problems in and of themselves. And as clusters, each one of them was conceived of containing its own problematique. So obsolete institutional arrangements would be like a tree with many branches and roots that would have its own issues, but then would be entangled with all of the others. And that he saw them interacting globally, regionally, interdependently, and intersensitive. That is that they, they touched each other in ways that could not be easily perceived by experts or others, that, but that would have, you know, like butterfly wing complexity effects on the others, and that they were immune to linear problem solving or causa and causal analysis. That is, uh, any attempt to re redress these issues through uh, linear problem solving was bound to fail. And I think that still is the case. And the insight of the global problematique in 19 was that in 1970, the, this kind of temporal urgency was considered that the window of time in which any of those um, major issues could be recognized and ameliorated at the time um, as discrete societal concerns was passing. That there was a window of time in which you could actually address obsolete institutional arrangements or insufficient um, education for the time, or uh, I guess they were addressing poverty with a great society around that time and, that, and programs like that. But these were more, he was looking at more the root cause, some of the, or the, the deeper issues that where we could really take action. And he was saying that if as that window passed, that all of these issues were going to become entangled and evolve from these discrete matters of concern into overlapping interconnected problem clusters that became, 
eventually, as we might even see today, a non-decomposable whole problem system of problems uh, generating itself, gener continuing to, you know, so we often think of autopoiesis as like a cool form of self-organization and also problem self-organize and they self-reproduce and they, and they interact with each other in the same way that living systems do. Uh, these types of, of, of systems can be seen to do that. And so we're dealing with an almost entirely outcome effects of multi effects. So, you know, so to test this notion, uh, consider for yourselves, you know, how we are attempting to address climate change now. I mean, except in some of the, I'm also uh, a board member of the Project Drawdown in Toronto. Uh, Drawdown Toronto has been, you know, we've been trying to educate people on the, the scientific solutions, scientifically based range of solutions for addressing um, carbon impacts through creative and scientific approaches that can actually be done locally. But most of the way the climate crisis has been kind of framed is that we're dealing with large policy issues and carbon credits and trading and carbon policy at, at national levels. But we're dealing with an effects system here that is the ultimate outcome of, of decades of uh, decades of problem systems uh, upon problem of multi-causal inputs and drivers leading to how you know this ultimate system of effects and yet you know what we're what sometimes it, it seems to me that the movements are attempting to do are to push for what might be a single solution silver bullet such as carbon dioxide reduction okay you know i mean we want to see that as a measure but that is not a solution in and of itself. And, and this is where I think some of the, the thinking that comes from taking into account, you know, the entire problem, you know, the entire problematique is a way of, of better resolving that. So when these kinds of, when these large, large scale problem systems overwhelm our cognitive and problem solving capacities, we oversimplify, we look for some silver bullets, uh, or as my, my mentor, uh, Christakis's colleague, John Warfield, like to say, we under-conceptualize. And when we work together in, um, in, in groups, we under-conceptualize even more. So we, uh, you know, so it, it makes it hard to even uh, collaborate and develop collective, you know, collect approaches to collective wisdom for amelioration, because we are you know, we, we become, um, you know, our, our conceptualization, our modes of, of problem solving become even more restricted in some ways. So we need creative ways of, of actually engaging. We'll say more about that in a bit. Let me say something about, I want to tell you a quick story about the Club of Rome, a few minutes here, about how that formed and, and how that has kind of led us to today. So the history of the Club of Rome lends insight into how we form global action networks today. So I might have mentioned there are a number of, of groups that are uh, global action networks and multi-stakeholder, multi-expert groups that are addressing uh, the sustainable development goals in different ways. I probably belong to five of these different groups, um, maybe two in Canada, three internationally. And so these, uh, the Club of Rome is probably the earliest group formed in 1970 that dealt with the, that created, you know, an international of um, global problem solving frame. And it had in its roots the, um, the OECD um, uh, um, approaches to policy management at the time and leading policy institutions of the 60s. It was quite technocratic. Um, and I think that also result, resulted in the approaches that we're seeing in kind of big system projects, you know, very much in the 1960s frame of the best and the brightest. Um, the Club of Rome is formed by the Executive Committee, um, Alexander King, who was the OECD science advisor from throughout the 1960s. Um, very well-respected system scientist and, and, um, and, um, uh, and uh, Aurelio Pache, who was the, uh, Pache was the, uh, ex uh, the chief executive of FIAT at the time, as well as Hugo Thiemann from Battelle in Switzerland. They convened a series of workshops in Bellagio with Eric Jansch, who was also at, with OECD at the time. And as they grew that, um, apparently those workshops 
were kind of fumbling through, but they led to a point where they formed, they wanted to form, convene kind of this meeting of leading systems thinkers to address you know, the predicament of mankind, as, as it was called. And so the first, uh, they drew together uh, Hassan Ozbekan, who's well known from the system, um, system Development Corporation think tank, Jay Forrester from MIT, Dennis Gabor, Rene Dubow, an environment, uh, early environmentalist um, systems thinker. And the first Club of Rome framed those concepts, the first concepts of the planetary emergency. And the original prospectus of the Club of Rome then was written by Hassan Ozbekan as an open brief as the, um, as, and it was essentially competed with MIT for this roughly $1 million uh, prize to produce the first study for the Club of Rome. And so the global problematique, you could be seen as the first formal agreement about the high priority global issues of the time. Um, the first agreement as to what those would be. And, and Osbekan had published those ideas earlier, but then he was invited by the executive committee to prepare that brief, to pitch it and frame it. And his approach was, and, and this might give you an idea why it wasn't selected and why Limits to Growth was, is that, is that um, it had very high-minded ideals, the aim to achieve ecological balance and to define what that might mean on a global scale through understanding the deep system relations and designing new policies that would help address ecological balance on a world system scale to engage uh, the requisite variety of multiple stakeholders beyond experts, but to uh, Hassan Ozbekan believed that it was unethical to design social systems without the direct contribution of the stakeholders it would affect. And how do you do this in a world system scale? He believed that you needed to define the values base that people would agree would be the values that would be constructed and that we would work through for the new for the systems change that would guide ethical decision making. Um, it was a serious analytical project at the same time to discover felicitous relationships between um, the, the 49 continuous critical problems, their synergies, their underlying you know, root issues, and what we would call leverage analysis today. Uh, to develop, a, he had a strong critique of the problem solving mindset. He said, you can't, you, we will never resolve these issues through problem solving. And we got in fact, the word problem is problematic and it's the problematique is problematic. But he kept trying to push back on the technocratic tendency to decompose and solve everything. Difficult in 1970 because that's, that as you know, has persisted through 50 years. And he called for new modes of reasoning and planning, relational uh, modes of reasoning in stakeholder groups, feedback, feed forward, futures creative modes of, of engagement, you know, proposing idealized futures, all modes of reasoning, but especially abductive reasoning, which is really a design mode. And we know from the well-documented history of the Limits to Growth project that um, the executive committee chose Jay Forrester's proposal, the MIT proposal, and the MIT team is also then famously composed of, of Dennis and Danella Meadows, Jurgen Randers, all had different skills that they brought on the team, but within two years, the Limits to Growth study was, was actually produced, and it was formed on the basis of running state-of-the-art simulations of, pri of a small set of primary variables that they believed were underlying the pro uh, problematique. So the public success of the limits to growth was evident in the rapid progress that was made to publish uh, within two years this publicly accessible non-technical exposition of actually system dynamics models that were run based on the world model simulation. And what was really powerful about that simulation as presented or was it created a mental model that, that readers of the limits to growth could then act on or, or, or would, would take into account. When you spoke of the limits to growth, people knew what that meant. Um, and it had in it, in it created an idea of the future prospect of these, these um, critical tipping points and collapse points, which, which were stated under different assumptions and different scenario conditions, which we're seeing happen now, essentially in 2020, which was kind of the critical uh, crossing over point in, in the 
in the standard and typical model. So this basic behavior mode was uh, of the limits to growth was an exponential, which was a model of exponential growth of population in capital, followed by a collapse. And in these scenarios, this typical run shows multiple collapses occurring right about like 2020. You can just see the crossover points. This said an in, in industrial output, um, population of food um, peak, pollution peak, which wasn't a high peak, but it started to decline because production was declining, and declines in resources and capital as well, as population had peaked. And then, and so their, their assumptions in the early 70s, they did well enough with the information available. And it made a compelling story. The dynamics of it still seem to be proven, even to some extent, even if their um, assumptions and actual data were not. But they were hugely criticized for their Malthusian assumptions about the global limitations of production. That as it did, did not foresee the huge synergies that were going to actually develop in technological development. Um, uh, the proposed overshoot and collapse model as well, that was also later developed by people like um, um, ecological economists, Catton, Nicholas, uh, uh, George, uh, George S. Rogen, um, that was redolent of Marx's predictions of the failure of capitalism. It just fed right into, you know, Marxist scholarship and that this is, this is predicting the failure of capitalism, right? But unfortunately for the predicament of humanity, such a positivist and hard scientist, hard science presentation created a huge target for growth capitalism and mainstream um, liberalism as well. So it was uh, technologists, managers, especially economists, just, you know, pushed back hard. The blow, political blowback was such that the limits to growth went into submergence or submerged really for another 20 years or more. And it didn't re really return in kind of serious discourse to any extent until the 30 year review in 2002. I mean, environmentalists and ecological economists were still discussing it and or it had some growth in the 90s, but not really on a big, you know, it started to come back as actually its predictions started to come back. Now, here I want to say Hassan Ozbekan's proposal. Remember I said his proposal to the Club of Rome was rejected. It was hugely ambitious. It was insanely insightful. I encourage you to read the whole thing. And, but it was considered unduly complex, uh, overreaching, um, under underdeveloped methodologically. You know, we had insights into methodology. There was no method yet for, or no technology for suitable engagement of stakeholders. Um, and it and it was under conceptualized in terms of how it actually might be, you know, perform conducted as a million dollar study. So, so what happened with kind of the rejection of, the, you know, of the author of the, the, the prospectus itself, this leads to the dynamics of the motivated also ran. And I've been one of those, and maybe you have too, which is you put a lot of investment into a pretty significant project. And at some point it gets rejected. And at that point you've like invested and learned, you know, half a year or a year's worth of engagement. And what do you do with that? So, so this proposal, his proposal and his approaches leading up to this was so far reaching and promising that there were a, a, a small school of system scientists that, that including Eric Yanch, who kind of left the Club of Rome to, to work on other things. Um, um, and my mentor, uh, Aleko Christakis and his colleague, John Warfield, who were part of that circle you know, that in the nascent field of social systems design. And so where the typical view of systems thinking schools consists of, you know, hard systems, which are system based on system dynamics and system modeling, soft systems or, you know, Checkland's soft systems methodology, critical systems, um, critical systems theory, I guess you could say postmodern, but as well as cybernetics and complexity. Peter, but, yep. I'm just going to okay. flake. Uh, we reached the 40 minute mark. Oh, okay. Oh, let me uh, let me wrap with uh, some some wrapping up points because the, sure. the key to this is all of this is this is a school of systems theory that people don't really know too much about, but this has been developed kind of in a in a slow way over many years, and then has and has had it's so it's still got a life of its own. Um, and so Hassan went on to consulting at Wharton, and and, and he 
ended up dying. He died in 2009. Um, I think the same year is actually his kind of his rival, Rasekov, also passed away. But what Hassan was missing was an engagement process, which is essentially what I've been trying to develop ever since and with, with, um, um, uh, with Aleko Christakis's work, which came out of uh, this work from the 1970s. Christakis developed software for um, engaging, a, a de for democratic engagement of stakeholders, which was essentially, and has been developed from like um, DOS packages in the, in the 90s to Windows packages to now online and web systems. So just to wrap up, let me say, I think a long view like this helps us keep a cool head under the uncertainties and extraordinarities of the current era. And um, my own networks have taken me into multiple projects where this viewpoint has certainly helped. Um, I think there are, you know, if, if we look at the SDGs today, the uh, Sustainable Development Goals as a kind of simplistic solution-oriented approach. It helps to also can consider the complex problematique behind that. That is the, the, the ways of problem resolution that we can identify um, leverages and relationships that could make significant progress towards some of them and to reach all of them. And so the SDGs I think is a laudable but broad sweep approach. There are a number of system mapping projects going on right now trying to identify these leverages, including one with a, a former graduate student of, of mine that I'm trying that I'm working with. But the key issue, a few key issues we need to know is how do we stop solving the wrong problems? Are we focused on the right problems? Are we, um, if, our, if these problems are so interconnected, how do we address the right level of leverage? Where do we go in? How do we design processes for addressing that? Can we proceed from a normative frame like Ozbekan had suggested or demanded? What ought we to do? How do we discover our values base? How do we critique the problem solving mindset? Um, how, do we, um, how do we address the assumptions of problem uh, or like Latour perhaps at identifying them, rethinking them as matters of concern and not problems. And so I would kind of leave it, I can leave it there, I guess, to open it up for, for questions and discussion as to really what ought we do, because I guess my answers are design, of course, systemic design at that. But so let me just take a few questions from there and, and, and have some discussion with you. Great. Uh, yeah, we have a lot of delicious questions for a delicious topic. Uh, are you just, if we have 15 minutes to the hour, are you okay to uh, like hang out like 10, 15 minutes after the hour? Or do you have I am if people are. Yeah. Okay, cool. So we'll feel it out. Um, Dan, you had a question, just got a plus one, if you can unmute yourself. Dan Phelps. Um, wait, I, it's, <laughs> I seem to have a few, uh, yeah. Um, th thank you very much, Peter. I asked a bunch of questions. I'm, I'm hearing an echo of myself here, I'm sorry. Um, I'll go and mute for a second. I, I, What's my question? I asked like three or four questions. Um, when I, I guess the one, one question most alive? is, is the model that Ozbekan presented, is it, was the, the approach and the framing too cognitive, cognitively complex for most people to really understand what he was trying to do? Uh, and then it lacked that simplicity that's one question. And then the other question is, which I didn't ask, which was, is at, at the base of the design, you know, the approach of how to go about this, one of the things that I'm discovering in, a, in similar areas is this all comes down to values at the very beginning. And some people have a, a model that humans are just greedy, selfish beings, and therefore incessant infinite growth is just a given and they have to just kind of trust in the market to save us all and the idea that you know we should organize around uh, values of dignity and well-being for each and all and integrity um, is kind of like disney world thinking and i'm wondering if that if these issues are issues that you've encountered or if you have any perspective on how to address those Oh yeah, thanks, Dan. Yeah, uh, first of all, um, 
Hassan Osbakan was probably, was actually 50 years ahead of his time. Um, uh, a, a colleague had started to compose a biography of his work, which was hard to do. Uh, we have access to his archives, but he didn't publish very many papers, maybe five, and some of them are like what we would call blogs today. But if you read his um, the general theory of, of planning um, from 1969, 1967, the triumph of technology and the prospectus of the, the predicament of, of mankind itself, this is less than 40 pages. They are dense and brilliantly conceived and they are you know, just so, I think, concisely framed that it's not just, it's not that it was complex, it was just in a language that people weren't ready to grasp very well. Um, the first generation systems thinkers did not suffer fools. I've, I didn't go to Wharton, but I've talked to people, I, I make it a point to talk with people who have studied, who were um, lucky enough to study with Osbekan in the 70s and 80s. And he was difficult. He was extremely difficult. And you'd think a lot of this would be almost qualitative, and it was, it was qualitative and quantitative. And so he was very rigorous and demanding. And so I think some of that was also, you know, so was probably Forrester, but maybe MIT had more of a team approach. And Ospikon wasn't really known for collaboration so much, but he was he was a formidable thinker. And and people and, and Everyone who knew him said that this was well ahead of their time. And so the approach to the limits to growth took probably was a way of actually saving what could have been a very complex project if, if Hassan had actually led it. I mean, maybe, you know, Eric Yanch and Warfield and Christakis would have come together for it. I don't know what team he would have made. And maybe they would have formed, created the software then. But what actually happened is they developed that software with Vitell later, but without Hassan. But they stayed, these, these guys tended to stay in touch with each other. But I found, and also with Warfield and Christakis, it was those, you could never put two of these guys in the room together. They're just very huge people. So there is that. They, they expected you to be able to follow, but so, so they conceived very, conceived big. Um, and also the complexity of what might be done, the technology wasn't there at the time. And so the limits to growth was a way of, you know, eight variables run on computer simulation, you know, you know, using system dynamics modeling at the time, which is still what you might do today. Um, and then uh, Hassan's um, key insight about working from the value space is, I mean, that's actually one of the things that inspired um, uh, my own PhD research in embedded values in organizations. And I agree with you that that, is, that is, it is not just the place to start, it is a place to start, but you have to continue to, un, to um, return to values. It's not, like I, it's not like a research project to survey, you know, instrumental and, and um, in, you know, instrumental and ontological and, and, and uh, formal values within organizations and individuals and kind of map them and identify priorities. I mean, you can do that, but this um, stakeholder, but a, a true stakeholder engagement approach has to respect the requisite variety of people, stakeholders that are invested in the uh, decisions and the outcomes of the problem system that they're, that they're working with. And so, you know, in the, in the, the software process of dialogic design, we attempt to do that. And there's some work on the values in advance of getting people together into a room or into a virtual engagement. And, and so that we understand what types of values conflicts might take, you know, take shape in that. And I think there's to also add one more thing to that. I didn't mention, I sort of dropped Bruno Latour in talking about the matters of concern, which is from his um, a cautious Prometheus paper about design from 2008. But in what was it, 2014, 2015, he wrote um, an inquiry into modes of existence, which is about the different ontology, uh, ontological um, values sets, the essentially 14, 15 different modes of existence. 
and that how we have to understand those in order to compose a common world and to reestablish trust in institutions. Needless to say, that didn't happen, but I think that those are some models that are very consistent with what Ozbekan wanted to do, and I think that is a place to start and end. All right. Um, Anjan, you had a question. Um, hey, Peter. We, we had Dave Snowden on the STOA over the last month, and he's, uh, he's kind of a curmudgeon, and he made an interesting comment. Um, he, he basically contrasted systems thinking with complexity and said system thinking, he's like, ah, bunch of schmucks. Because um, what they try to do is model future scenarios and work backwards. He thought complexity makes more sense because what it tries to do is map the, the present um, and work towards an attractor and following energy gradients. I'm curious what you think of Snowden's framing and how you see complexity and systems thinking fit together in contrast. Uh, I understand that model. I think it also fits with uh, Canavan um, uh, model as well. And I teach that and bring that into the classroom. So my, you know, my students will understand that as well. Um, how I view the approach is not systems as systems thinking, but as well, um, the relationship of of systems theory as an underpinning to design. And so design is, is a way of, of working with complexity that is probably certainly consistent with complexity theory and with, with Dave Snowden's model. And I think he probably views it as a type of design, but him, he's more of a, a planner and a complexity scientist in, in, his, in his work and and, and I do work with design, you know, with large scale design projects, with information design, system and service design. And so I, I look, you know, what we've formed in the last decade is, is a relationship of, of compatible systems theories that actually do take into account um, strategic foresight and backcasting, feedback and feed forward, leverage analysis and complexity in cybernetics principles where they apply. So like good designers, we look at the principles. Um, I have a paper from 2014 on, um, on um, systemic design principles for complex social systems. And I've identified 10 overlapping principles that are shared between systems complexity and cybernetics, but I call them systems principles, and that, that are shared with design principles. So those are like, um, Ideal, an idealized system, um, uh, boundary framing. So a brief is a, is, a, is a framing, but boundary critique is a systems method. Um, like um, uh, requisite variety ought to be a design principle. So I just leave it in Ashby's mode because it's still a frame, uh, still core to cybernetics and complexity as well. Um, appreciating complexity, uh, you know, um, uh, generative feedback, uh, compositional design. Uh, these are ways of approaching kind of both, both fields so that they can, they, so I think of it simply put as, as a, a compatible systems theory that supports effective design for complex contexts. And we've had a conference for the last nine years on this RSD, um, Relating Systems Thinking and Design, which is actually next week. So I can put my plug in there now that if you look up rsd9.org, um, it will show um, a conference being sponsored in National Institute of Design in, in India, who's one of, our, one of our partners from the very beginning, helping kind of frame the theory, practice, and, and research base that is that is developed and if you look at our past um projects um, so i'd say even dave dave snow not a look at the uh, proceedings of the last eight years and some of our keynotes that include people like randolph glanville and uh, and uh, john john thakura and and uh, the um and my mentor christakis as well as umberto macharana remotely and we had uh when i sponsored the conference in toronto uh, Paul Pangaro, Eric Stolderman, uh, 
you know, so the a range of designers and systems thinkers and in, in design and as well as I think I share this maybe uh, interest with the STOA on, you know, we're also getting as much as possible um, legacy thinkers while we can, you know, so Randolph Glanville gave his last talk. He had, he had cancer. He died three weeks after his talk in Oslo in 2014. And, um, and Aleko probably isn't traveling very much anymore. And, you know, and, and there are a number I'd like to get. We have Vandana Shiva, Vandana Sh speaking, um, you know, virtually, but in, in this conference. So it's cheap. It's in India. So I'd encourage you. But that's where I'm, that's where I think, that's where my future interests are. And that's what I think resolves the conflicts between those those disciplines because I'm trying to work in a different interdiscipline. Okay. All right. Um, uh, Anjan, you want to do a quick follow-up? Um, feel free to punt if we don't have enough time. I was just going to ask Peter, just from kind of your personal experience, how do you like have so many models and not get overwhelmed? Um, I'm what, old. Is, what is the personal <laughs> MO and habits? <laughs> I'm older. <laughs> That's some of it. Is is you develop them over time. I mean, um, if I tried to embrace all those when I first started, um, and they become additive and and then get constructed uh, through dialogue and conversation, and I and 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 some people go depth first, and I'm more breadth first, and then I continue to cycle over them as I get, develop more interest. And I look for projects where I can apply them. So I'll keep, you know, so for many years, I had like a, um, a pervasive but not deep interest in panarchy and ecological systems, but then it became essential. So I'd have, I was kind of hovering and circling around, you know, uh, Hollis and Gunderman, the ecological economics. But then I started working on a project with uh, an ecological economist for what we now call the flourishing business model, the strong um, designing business models for strong sustainability and the integration of social, social economic and environmental um, impacts that are all considered between stakeholders, the value proposition and the business. That required developing, you know, knowledge, deeper knowledge in those system, in that system model. So you go deeper when you need to. In the meantime, you get conversant with other people so you can hold a conversation, I guess. And, but also I've been you know, living with some of these models since um, high school. I mean, I started reading like R.D. Lang and Gregory Bateson just out of interest because some of my smart, smart aleck friends were you know, reading that in high school and we'd pass like politics of experience, we'd get passed around like some secret doctrine. It was mind blowing. I didn't realize that was systems theory. And you find out later as these ideas start to continue to blow your mind that they make sense and they, they build on each other. And so you get conversant. We have also a, a community of practice, which is now virtual held the second Monday of every month, um, Systems Thinkers Ontario. And we have um, speakers like David Hawk and me and David Ng. David Ng and I have been co-evolving, that's his, handle, co-evolving that since, uh, I guess, seven years now. And there's also, um, I think it's the second Tuesday. So after that Monday, the next, very next second Tuesday is the Strongly Sustainable Business Model Group, which is about 2,000 people internationally. And we have regular, like, leading speakers there. So if you're interested in those, you could either reach out to me or just look, kind of Google them and see what comes up, because each of those sites has wikis st on the dot wiki and ssbmg wiki and we'll tell you about the next upcoming sessions so those communities of practice help us you know um continue to just hold ongoing discussions about um, and and like journal clubs we'll read papers discuss them um sharpen just like in the stoa and sharpen our our interest or attention when i wrote the the um, systemic design principles paper, I was actually very nervous about putting that into the field because I hadn't published strongly in the systems, you know, in kind of the systems domain yet. I mean, actually I had before, but 
it was radically different and I wasn't sure it was going to be accepted. And so we did, the, this, the, the systems thinking Ontario group like spent two sessions reading it and critiquing it and talking about it and made it super strong. And I don't know if the STOA could, could do that with somebody's paper, but we do things like that. And I think that, you know, I would, I would recommend, you know, in the STOA using these ideas to, to sharpen our insights in that same way and, and the models that we have. So they, they, they grow over time and, and create conceptual frameworks that they fit into and, and they become more natural but we always continue, I'm always continued to be just blown away by those who are depth first. Like so many people that, that have gone so deep into a few models that just, you know, that it's just not my style. And uh, I'll have a few that are deep, but you know, it takes, there's, there are different skills. <laughs> so I'll just tell you who I admire <laughs> there. Well, awesome. Thanks. Um, so we'll have time for maybe one more question. Uh, Tim. You had a question and I'll copy and paste in the chats below. Yeah, hi, Peter. Um, thanks for the weaving together of history and all these different topics. It's been really interesting. Um, you may know that uh, I'm a designer and I spent a lot of time thinking about um, this problematique as you framed it. Um, and I, so I was really interested to see this um, topic around Uzbekan and um, I'm really concerned that uh, the, the language that and the framings, the problem framings that we're all using are effectively um, causing the system to, that we live in to self-perpetuate. And so I'm curious how you might suggest that we all uh, approach these kinds of issues. And you kind of alluded to the fact that like for the UN and the SDGs, for example, are kind of a simplistic framing. And I see them as, speaking of um, Bates and them as logical type errors in that they're framed around consequences and not conditions, right? So it, it, they don't really acknowledge even in their framing um, the mm -hmm. interconnectedness and the cross contextuality of the, of, the, of the problem, of the problematique itself. And so how, how do we get away from this uh, sort of tendency that you, you spent your essentially the entire talk talking about um, this oversimplification and this like um, winnowing things down into these uh, we, we start looking for these silver bullet solutions and so that's the question like how to how to essentially even in the framing get away from this uh, perpetuating the system that we live in it's a very big question that would be a good way to actually introduce a, an entirely different talk which is uh, which is essentially knowing this, what ought we to do? And that would also involve aesthetics and ethics and dialogue and virtues, ontologies uh, and framing. And so I've suggested some approaches that I like and some ways of, I think, addressing ways to, um, uh, ways to um, uh, work around the problem solving mindset, the consequentialist approach to for example, the, to um, account for that accounts for the uh, the um, uh, oh, uh, the simplistic kind of policy oriented framing of the seventeen uh, uh, sustainable development goals. There are many kind of, kind of problematic um, aspects to the SDGs that I didn't even start to address, but probably the biggest the the, the biggest problem of framing is that they're called sustainable development goals, which really, you know, uh, shows their relationship going back to the 1986 Brutland report of, of um, our, our, you know, our, our common, our common earth, and which was good at the time, and framing sustainable development as the approach that world institutions ought to be using to address um, at that time, the problematique. And that may not have been considered a problem solving approach, but what happened was sustainable development became conceived as more what we would see in, in, an, in an industrial organizational approach to managing policy outcomes to address you know, the, the effects of these problem systems, which, which is, and you're right, it is a it is a, a, a 
a category error, and that makes it very hard to um, it makes it very hard to reframe because everybody you can assume in almost any engagement around the SDGs has already bought into the SDGs. The one way that I've been addressing uh, kind of a a feed forward approach to the sustainable development goals and, and the program itself is to engage in working with some of the some of the kind of the new economies programs that are willing to go into and address SDG 8, which actually is about um, economic growth relative to different um, geographic contexts. And I think that that's a problematic SDG because it is framed around economic growth and it doesn't allow for the new, new frames of economic systems to emerge. And so we, I, it, it also just so happens that a, a graduate of our SFI program is, is actually the, uh, uh, the director at, in the UNDP uh, program. The, he does the analysis funding and allocation of the, of the, of the, um, uh, of the nations that are the recipients of, of the UN's fund for the SDG development. And so he's using, and he's a, he's a real fan of Ozbekan's work and he knows Christakis and he's worked with these methodologies. And so I'll just say that, you know, in the discussions I've, I've had with people like that, we are starting to push for something like flourishing goals, which might be at 2030. And that's a long time to wait, but if you can feed forward, you can just, you know, this is basically breaking the frame, right? It's what you would do with a design brief if you could. Um, we often can't, but what you can do within the projects you're in is to, you know, find places where you can break through the frame and start to approach a more, you know, a creative, um, uh, you know, a, a creative, um, um, I don't want to say redress, but it's, it's essentially through, through provocation at first, but then through democratic dialogue with the other mem you know, with the members of the, uh, you know, of the, of the global action network or the problem, you know, the problem framing group you're working with. But if, we're, if you're as a designer also working with stakeholder groups directly, you also need to work with the kind of the core problem, you know, the core team that is framing the, you know, the relationship to that, you know, to the SDGs or to the context so that some rethinking can can be rethinking of the problem space can be done you know effectively by by the, by the different stakeholders and i think it it helps to do very rigorous selection of um of stakeholders for the requisite variety necessary for that for that frame which means inviting people sometimes they think of it as getting the whole system in the room and that usually means like large group engagements, but you can do, um, uh, you know, there are approaches that I've been developing of um, evolutionary stakeholder discovery, which, which look for the, the intersecting relationships between people who have expertise and lived experience in, a, in the problem areas, who have, um, who have an ontological commitment in, a, in, a, in one area or another that, that they're able to bring. So you have, you know, an eco, you don't just have an eco, ecological economists, but you have small business people and you might have urban and rural and, and older and younger and people who are subject to bad decisions and people who are owners of those decisions in the same space of design and going from dialogue to design. So I think it can be difficult I think we, as a designer, might also know we, we um, can use a fix. We we can too easily fall into the fixation of the frame or leading people down garden paths if we um, use design thinking too early. Because design thinking has a way of creating kind of a false consensus, or what John Warfield would would say is 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 actually. A facilitated, a facilitating, a facilitating the creation of consensus so that people can feel productive as they engage in a problem solving, you know, processes. And so we need to have kind of this sufficient dissension in deep listening 
before you can actually engage design. So that's one reason I try to separate some of these system methods from design methods so that you can do a design approaches in the system methods and you can use system thinking in the design approaches as well. That's probably long winded, but a way I, I would think about it. So yeah. cool. Um, we're going to have to land the plane right now um, because okay. another event's starting soon. Um, but uh, Peter, any closing thoughts for us before we close up today? Uh, well, thanks for asking. I just say I'm, I'm glad I had the chance to address some of the questions that allowed me to um, maybe say a bit more about what what I've been doing. You know, in the last few years to um, to you know to live with the global problematique myself and to take it forward and to, and to, to consider it as a, a frame, not only for the way to rethink the problem framing and the problem space that we're working with, but also a way to, to rethink representation and to, and to, and to understand how long, uh, you know, to understand from histories, how long some of these programs might take and that when we may, be aware of our own um, hubris as designers or systems thinkers and planners in believing that we're going to you know change the world in in two to five years um, that we're still dealing with the global problematique in 50 years and if you read those 49 continuous critical problems as my my students do i give them the chance when we train in dialogic design i give them the chance to reframe osbekan's original wording and usually all they do is change some of the gendered language and sometimes not even that because it's kind of like uh, the archaic it's a little archaic but it really makes sense and there's something unfortunately that creates a new fixed frame almost you know they're afraid to break out of it but it just shows you know what that we're really still you know this is going to be with us and so we have to find creative approaches to get into the leverage for making progress. And that's what the design approach approaches are about. And so I'd recommend, you know, looking at some of the work that we're doing in systemic design and the relationship of these fields to each other and finding your own creative entry points into that. And so welcome you to participate in these communities that I've mentioned as well. They don't compete with the STOA, they all build on each other. And and I look forward to, to, to meeting some of you in person when they let us, you know, when they let us back out into the playground, so. Awesome. And uh, I recommend saving the, the chats. If not, I can send it to you afterwards because there was a rich uh, dialogue happening there and uh, some questions. And I'll quote one, uh, Peter Jones is fucking amazing. OMG. Uh, and a bunch of people were requesting you to be uh, a sense maker in residence, which we were talking about. So again, I'd love to have you back at the STOA. And it was a great uh, session. So thank you for coming, Peter. Thank you. Thank you. And I, I loved it. Talk to you later. Right. All right, everyone. Uh, and uh, about 15 minutes, we have Daniel Schmachtenberger, uh, 7.30 p.m. Eastern time to start his SenseMaker Residence series. Uh, it's called The Digital Porch. All Daniel's going to do is going to sit down on the digital porch and we're going to ask him questions. And that's going to be over four weeks this month. So you can check that out uh, on the website. Uh, post all the links here, the STOA, our Patreon site, and Substack. That being said, uh, everyone, thanks again for coming to STOA. Slice and burn, return, listen to yourself, churn.